Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so as Ben said, my name is Seth. I'm the Director of Evangelism or Technical Advocacy uh, at HashiCorp. Uh, I always like to start these off by saying that I am an engineer by trade, though. So I'm on stage. I'm saying things to you. But like, I went to school for computer science. And if you look at the Git log of some of these tools that I'm going to be talking about, you'll see that I contribute to them very heavily. Um, so I'm, I'm not just a big figurehead. Uh, I actually do know what I'm talking about, I promise. Just take my word for it. How many people here have heard of the company HashiCorp before Mitchell's keynote? OK, good. Um, so there are a few of us here. Uh, Mitchell did a, a keynote. We have um, James Nugent is here as well. But for those of you that aren't familiar, we're an open source company. We make a number of open source tools, starting with Vagrant, uh, kind of running through the mix. So today, I want to talk about one of those tools, which is Consul. But before I talk about console, I really want to take a step back, because I know everyone in here has different backgrounds, different experience levels. And I want to give a very quick uh, SOA primer, or service-oriented architecture primer. Because console is designed to operate in a microservices-oriented architecture. And I think it's really important that we define what that actually means before we start talking about it and looking at how it might be used. So <clears throat> in terms of like what is an MSA or an SOA, we're looking at something that has uh, an autonomous, limited scope, loose coupling. So we're looking at applications that have a very well-defined behavior. And those applications generally communicate sequential processes with each other. So for example, you may have something like a traditional like uh, three or four tier web application. You know, you have your database and your load balancer. Um, but that web application might be broken apart into a number of different microservices. And you can think of a microservice as just a node on a graph, and information flows to that node, and that node does some type of transformation. Maybe it modifies the data, maybe it does some processing of the data, maybe it uh, pushes the data off or splits it or copies it or clones it. So in this example, we have a front-end web application, but the data is actually being pushed into two different uh, microservices. Maybe one is an order processing service uh, and one is a forecasting service. So one is actually doing the batch processing of maybe billing and credit card processing and the other one is doing things like forecasting, inventory, or maybe providing uh, recommendations back to the web app. And then on the back end we have our persistent data store, the actual order history, you know, MySQL database, Postgres, whatever it might be, where the data is persisted to disk. So the first question that we have, we've, we've broken up what was traditionally a monolith, something that was all in one app, into a number of different microservices. And each of those services might be running in a container. They might be running on something like you know, Cloud Foundry, some platform as a service. But they all have an IP address now. And whether that IP is on an overlay network or it's you know, a, a B-level network, it doesn't matter. But it has an IP address. And we have, to, we have to find those things now. So how does the web app actually send a request to the order processing service? How do we find it? So that's the first problem that you get in, an, in a microservices-oriented architecture, is you've broken apart the monolith into little pieces. What is the glue between those pieces? And how do we send information over the wire to address those pieces? The second component, then, is after you find a way to address those pieces, one of the benefits of a microservices-oriented architecture is that you have the ability to scale out very quickly. So if you have a lot of order processing, you can just spin up another order processing node, and you put a load balancer in front of it. So half the traffic goes to one, and half the traffic goes to another. But how do you ensure like, request-level processing across the different providers? Well, typically, you put a load balancer in front of it. But that's generally an anti-pattern, uh, especially on an internal network, because you're creating a single point of failure. So you move to a microservices-oriented architecture so that you wouldn't have a single point of failure, so that if one order processing node went down, the remainder could pick up the work. But then you put a load balancer in front of it. And if HAProxy or NGINX or whatever your load balancer is goes down, now all of a sudden, all of your order processing is down. And then lastly, behind that, and sometimes this is integrated with the load balancer, is how do you avoid sending traffic to unhealthy microservices? So if a microservice defines its own health, how can we make sure that the web app doesn't send that particular node uh, an, an order so that we don't you know, accidentally lose it or whatever? So, uh, and one of the last components, uh, components is how do you adequately push config? So in, in this web app, maybe I have 10 or 15 front end uh, web applications. How do I do something like feature flagging without forcing a chef client run or a puppet run or Ansible across the entire fleet? I just want to take 50% of my nodes and I want to, for five seconds, enable a feature, collect some log data, and then I want to turn it off again. 
If your chef puppet Ansible Salt runs take 30 minutes, you don't have that, that ability, right? You want something very instantaneous, maybe just for a few seconds. So how do we push out dynamic configuration to these nodes? How do we limit that configuration to a subset and control that push? So that really brings us to four basic problems. Uh, service discovery, which is uh, one could argue a solved problem, is how do I, I have all these microservices or all these machines or applications, and how do I find them? Um, and then once I find them, how do I balance traffic across them? How is that traffic health checked such that I don't send traffic to unhealthy nodes? And then somewhat out of left field is this dynamic push configuration where I have this runtime config and I need to get it onto nodes and I need to get it in as close to real time as possible. So these are the four basic problems of a microservices oriented architecture or a service oriented architecture. So there are some existing solutions to some of these problems. So you may be familiar with Zookeeper. Zookeeper is a service discovery tool, but it doesn't do any of that runtime configuration. It doesn't do that health checking component. You might be familiar with etcd, which is an excellent distributed key value store, but it has nothing to do with service discovery. Sensu is an excellent tool for monitoring, just like Nagios, but it can't react to changes in the system. Um, so it can just alert you, but it can't actually heal or not send traffic to unhealthy nodes. So we designed console with these four things in mind. Um, at HashiCorp, we have a number of engineers who have combined like probably over 100 years of operational experience, and we wanted to design a tool that solved all of these problems in a single package. So console provides service discovery via the HTTP and DNS APIs. What does that actually look like? Well, if you're familiar with DIG, which is just a tool for resolving DNS, console provides a top-level namespace, or a TLD, for the .console suffix, which is configurable if you'd like to use something else. So the same way that you would query for like example.com, Google, Facebook.com, you get to query for services that are named. We call this a logical service name in console. So I name my service web front end or order dash processing or you know, back end dash server, and I register that with console. And the way you register a service with console we'll see in a minute. That then becomes available to search in console's catalog simply via DNS. So applications that are legacy or don't have the ability to integrate with HTTP APIs, they can then rely on the kernel to do basic DNS resolution against the console suffix to identify other services in the system. So if you imagine you have some big, bulky, legacy Java application that it's going to be years until you can split that into microservices, but you want to adopt this paradigm, you can just point your Java app at like postgres.service.console, and console will do the load balancing for you. Your Java application doesn't have to adopt new paradigms. It can exist in the new paradigm. It's completely unaware that it's actually using a, um, something that's not you know, bind nine or a, a top-level name server to do this resolution. It's actually using a dynamic tool like console. Here's a sample response from that. You'll notice we get back A records. Those A records are randomized round robin. So it'll return three records. But if you have 50 services, it'll randomize round robin between those three services, uh, between the 50 services returning three at a time. If those services run on a different port, or if they're advertising different ports, you can query for a special type of record, an SRV record, and that'll tell you which port that particular service is running on. And we'll look at some examples there in a little bit. The second thing is console is data center aware, particularly it's multi-data center aware. So this is console's architecture, very simplified in a single data center. At HashiCorp, we define a data center as a high, uh, high bandwidth, low latency collection of machines. So that means something like an Amazon VPC is a data center. We don't define it as like a physical brick and mortar data center because a lot of our customers are in the cloud and they don't have a physical brick and mortar data center. <clears throat> Console runs uh, as a single binary, but it runs in either client or server mode. So there's an agent, it runs as a client or a server or both. The clients communicate with the servers via RPC calls. Uh, the clients and the servers all participate in what's called a, a gossip protocol, uh, primarily over UDP. This gossip protocol is effectively them broadcasting information about themselves. Um, and that traffic can be encrypted if you're on an untrusted network. So if you imagine we're all in this room right now, and if everyone just started saying their name aloud, let's just do this. It's an exercise, right? Everybody just say your name aloud on repeat for like five seconds. Yeah, so that gets noisy, right? So that's why it's high bandwidth, low latency. 
Because in order for someone over here to inform someone over there of their name, it has to kind of go through a number of other people, right? You're talking over each other, but you're also remembering people's names next to you, and gradually that information flows to the other end of the room. If you have really high latency, that takes a long time. And when we talk about health checking, that'll be important. The servers operate <clears throat> in a traditional HA mode. So the, the one with the star there is the leader. It's pushing replication data out. The servers that are in follower mode are sending the requests in. So traditional client-server relationship, all, cars are, all calls are over RPC between the clients and the servers. In a multi-data center architecture, we have the same exact setup in another data center, perhaps in Europe or in our case in the room next door, and we communicate via um, what's called the WAN gossip or the public internet gossip. And that might be through like a VPN tunnel or an SSH tunnel, but here I'm just using the ubiquitous symbol for cloud to indicate that that's going over some type of public channel where there is high latency. So this might be between two VPCs. If a client in data center A wants to talk to a client in data center B, they actually go through the servers. So if you wanted to talk to someone in the room next door, you would come talk to me, I would talk to their speaker, and their speaker would talk to them directly. <clears throat> the next component is host and service level health checks. And this is really what sets console, one of the things that sets console apart from other service discovery tools, is that we integrate the service discovery layer into health checking. So when you ask console, give me all of the services that are tagged web, or all of the services that are in a logical group named web, it is only going to return the services that are reporting as healthy. And those health checks run on the node itself. So if I have a node that's running you know, maybe five microservices, <clears throat> that node is the one that's running the health checks. So we don't have Nagios or Sensu that's actually calling out to the machine and saying, run these checks for me, give me back the result. The clients themselves are responsible for that. And we'll talk about the scalability challenges and how that solves some of the scalability challenges of some of the largest infrastructures in the world. Using some of the console tooling, like console template and env console, we can build really um, verbose integrations with console without the need to you know, interact with its API or understand all of these things. And I'll show you a demo of this in a little bit, but <clears throat> one of the most common things you can do with console is build a dynamic load balancer using something like HAProxy or Nginx, and as soon as the service becomes unhealthy or as soon as new services are added, they immediately become added to the load balancer. Um, so this is just an example of that, is when we stop a web server, the, the console template process you know, rewrites that config and like reloads Nginx or reloads HAProxy. When a new one becomes available, it adds it as well. And the slides don't do it justice, because uh, I'm going to do a live demo in a minute uh, to show you this. So the last component of console, and it somewhat feels out of left field until you really think about it, is this key value store. So we have this service discovery, and integrating service discovery with health checking kind of makes sense, but then all of a sudden, we have basically distributed Redis packed up inside of this thing. So where does that come from, and why is it useful? Well, <clears throat> the console um, HTTP API and the service discovery APIs are all available via HTTP. So here I'm using the console CLI to put data into the KV, but this could easily be a curl or you know, any HTTP call. And to read that data back out, I just query that data back out. And console stores a lot of metadata about that key. If I ask for the detailed information, I'll get things like a create index and a modify index. I can apply session, um, session information to it. Um, <clears throat> if you're familiar with like distributed systems, the KV store supports CAS operations, check and set operations. It supports locking, um, and it supports a number of different session types. Like you can create a key that gets deleted after it's used after a certain period of time. So TTLs and those types of things. So why, like, how does the KV store play into this stuff? Well, as I said before, you have this runtime configuration often where you need to push this tiny piece of config data or you need to push uh, a feature flag or you need to put a, a service in maintenance mode very quickly. And the key value store gives you the ability to do that without, <clears throat> without the overhead of building some other integrated system. The key value store is also important because some of the console primitives are actually built on top of it. So when we look at distributed locking here in a little bit, uh, in client-side leader election, console's key value store is actually what allows us to do a basic client-side leader election. So I always like to show this slide because these people are more important than me. And uh, it's a good time for a joke anyway. I've done a lot of talking and I talk really fast. You might have missed some stuff and the slides will be available afterwards. If you have engaged in the internet in the past 24 hours, there is 
like an 88% probability you've engaged with one of our open source tools, and there's about a 60% probability that that tool was console. Um, so if you've interacted with the internet, you've interacted with console. Um, you know, there are, there are a number of large companies that I can't name. Um, there are companies that have given us the ability to, to say that, but if you've ever streamed something on Twitch, that's directly using console. Um, so this isn't just a little tool that you play around with in your spare time. This is a tool that is running at incredible capacity at companies like Twitch and Datadog, where they're pushing it to hundreds of thousands of nodes in a single cluster and seeing amazing performance. So let's talk a little bit more about this health checking thing. So what is a health check? Well, a health check is just any command that returns an exit code. So a bash script, an HTTP call, a curl, whatever it might be. And if that check returns zero, if that exit code of that command is a zero, it's passing. If that exit code is one, it's warning. And if that is any other value, positive or negative, it's failing. So <clears throat> console's health checks are actually a trinary state, not binary. They're not passing or failing. There's this warning state. And this is important when you start talking about host level health checks, because something like disk space or CPU or RAM is not a binary operation, right? You don't just run out of RAM, right? You have a, a progression where you're like, hmm, I've hit about 70% capacity. Maybe I want to alert someone, but I don't want to take that out of the load balancer. I don't want, to, I don't want a, a human to actually have to do something yet, but I want, to, I want to send some information about that. And that's what warning is for. The output of the health check is captured as a note, so we can ask for the health information of a service, and that gets stored in console. Um, and there, um, <clears throat> there are ways to kind of triage that over time and trend it. So here's an example of a check that uses a custom script. So this is just a Python script that checks memory utilization, just showing that you can use basically anything on the system. Here's one of the built-in checks, which is an HTTP check. This is effectively going to make a curl and check that the response code is a, a 200 level response code. Checks are interesting because they allow us to build reactive infrastructure or responsive infrastructure. If you look at a traditional monitoring service like console or Sensu, they behave something like this. You have a number of nodes and those nodes are all pushing information into a service. So all of those nodes at some regular <coughs> interval are saying or pushing information into a silo, um, which generally creates like a single point of failure. The problem is that that silo doesn't have the ability to do anything back on those nodes. So unless you give your Nagios and Sensu cluster like an SSH key so that it can go SSH into machines to go repair things, it can't do that. Because the console agent runs on all of the machines and console is a cluster, console can take action based off of certain failures. So when your things go bump in the middle of the night, the only operation that a monitoring solution like Nagios or Sensu can do is to call you or paid you, and you know, how many people here have ever been on call? It's like the best thing ever, right? Um, no, it's, it's awful because nothing ever goes wrong during work hours. It's always three o'clock in the morning, and it's always three o'clock in the morning after your like, 12-year-old kid has kept you up playing video games until 2.30 in the morning. Um, so it, it, always, it always is the worst possible time, and wouldn't it be great if that could wait until morning or never interrupt you because your infrastructure can self-heal? And with console, that's possible. Because console, you'll notice these arrows here are bidirectional. So console is pushing data to the nodes, and the nodes are pushing data to console. Console removes unhealthy nodes from the service discovery layer. So if all the nodes are healthy, they get returned from the result. And you know, the kernel is doing DNS routing, your app is doing DNS routing. If one of them becomes unhealthy, they get removed from that list. <coughs> So whenever your, you know, your database.yaml file or your Rails app or your Django app is saying, oh, I want to talk to this thing, that all happens transparently. Like your app doesn't have to build special failure logic of like, oh, if this node's not here, then fail over to this one and then fail over to this one. That's all handled by console. And with console 0.6 and later, which for context we're on 0.7, we have built-in support for things like nearest neighbor routing. So you can actually tell your app to find the nearest database to it by estimated round trip time and if that doesn't work, then you can fail over to another region. So think about this. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, and your US data center goes down. Right? You run in US East 1, and as we know, that's the most reliable Amazon data center. So it goes down. Right? Your RDS cluster is like screwed up, and someone has to wake up and like manually fix Postgres. Or you could be using console and a prepared <laughs> query, and console could automatically fail over to the European region. And for all of those people who happen to be accessing your app during that time, yeah, they're going to have like another 500 milliseconds of latency. But they're going to blame their browser. right? They're not going to blame you. 
right? Verizon and Comcast are gonna get in trouble before you do. You wake up in the morning, you're like, oh crap, our entire US data center is down, but I got a full night's sleep. Okay, and again, <clears throat> traffic is not routed to uh, the unhealthy host. So uh, unhealthy nodes are not returned from DNS queries or the HTTP API queries. So the same as uh, if you hit the catalog, if you hit dig, hit the catalog, they're both gonna not return those results. The one thing that's interesting, um, I was looking for a particular slide and apparently I removed it, Console's monitoring solution is very scalable. And the reason it's so scalable is because we only alert on state change. So when you have something like Nagios or Sensu, every five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever, they're pulling out to the systems and saying, are you healthy, are you there, are you there, are you there? And the reason they have to do that is there's no way for them to detect if a node has died. Right? So they have to have these what are called heartbeats in order to detect that the node is still there. With console, we rely on the gossip protocol. So if you remember my example earlier where everyone was shouting their name, if the person next to you suddenly stopped shouting their name, you would notice, right? And that, the same thing applies to the gossip protocol at a technical level. The nodes are broadcasting information, and if one of them stops broadcasting, a series of their peers form a quorum and agree that that node is no longer there and market is unhealthy. So we don't have to continuously do these heartbeats and flood the network with an, a bunch of unnecessary traffic. Console has built-in support for client-side leader election and distributed locking, and that's brought to you by the console lock command. So for example, something like Redis is a little bit challenging to run in HA, unless you configure it correctly. Instead, you can run multiple Redis instances if you're running it statelessly, and you can run them in a console lock. And the first one will acquire the lock, and then the second one will block until the first one dies, gracefully or ungracefully, then the second one will pick up where it left off. So you can build things like client-side leader election. So for example, Vault is another one of our open source tools, and this is actually how Vault's leader election works. You spin up three Vault servers, they all attempt to acquire a lock on console, one of them wins. The other two go into standby mode, and that's your leader election. But what's great is that as a request comes in, console knows where the leader is, so it can handle the request forwarding or tell the client to handle the request forwarding for you. And whether that's a client-side redirect or a server-side request forward, it, it doesn't really matter. If one of those nodes becomes unhealthy, all of this time, the second and third Vault have been trying to acquire a lock, so when Vault 1 becomes unhealthy, it loses the TTL on the lock. The other two are still contending for it. One of them will win, it becomes the leader, and we, uh, the, you know, Vault 1 dies, and we kind of repeat that process. Console's now aware to forward request to that one, and we have client-side leader election. It basically solves the like exactly one of this much thing must be running problem, um, which this is a perfect time for an animated GIF. So pinwheel. <laughs> so this is a real thing that dogs do. I don't know like if you've ever, if anybody has a lot of dogs, but this is a real thing they do. They just keep pushing each other aside, and it's kind of like how console lock works. It's also fun. So it's really great for semaphores. Oh, there's my scalability stuff. Um, so it's really great for semaphores. So let's say you need to do a kernel upgrade across like your entire fleet. You super don't want to restart your entire fleet all at once, because that's going to cause downtime. You can use something like console lock to control maybe two or three at a time, and only once that server comes back up will it uh, be able to uh, release the lock for the next one. So how much time do I have? Seven minutes. That's enough time to do a demo. All right. So who likes live demos? You all do, right? And if you don't, you're lying. But you don't really want a live demo. You just want to watch me mess up, which is fine. I'm OK with that. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm on like the beta, so it's extra unstable. Um, just. <laughs> Just for why not? Uh, well, I'll give you a terminal prompt, and, and then I'll cheat and look at these notes that I wrote like three minutes ago. Okay, so I have this console cluster that I spun up in advance because I wasn't going to bore you with me typing things very slowly. Um, I want to show you the service discovery. So the dot service dot console suffix queries for all of the services, and you can see there I got three A records back. This cluster happens to only have three running, um, so you're always gonna get those same three back, but they're gonna be randomized round robin. <coughs> this is running on EC2, but this will work in any cloud or your own data center. We can query for the SRV records. So if I SRV this, um, you'll get back, you can see that these are all running on port 80. So all three of these nodes are running on port 80. If one of them becomes unhealthy, they don't get returned from that DNS entry anymore. But what if we wanted to build something a little bit more verbose, right? Console's DNS is very scalable, but some people really like their bind nine and their HA proxies. Uh, or maybe you're doing like client-side load balancing and you want to build something a little bit more robust. Well, how might you do that? 
Well, there's this tool called console template <clears throat> that allows us to do that. So I have here a snippet of what might look like an HAProxy or Nginx config. We do some backends, we balance round robin, and then we just list a number of servers, right? For those of you that are familiar with HAProxy, this, this looks pretty real. And I've hard-coded some in here. Um, those aren't totally valid IPs or ports. I just kind of hard-coded them in advance. So how might we integrate this with console? Well, we need this server, that's a keyword, and then we need the name of a node, we need its IP address colon port, and then this keyword name check. So if we ask for the node, we can ask for the node, and then we can ask for the IP, I think it's address, colon port, and uh, check. Okay, so if those magical things got filled in, right, we would have the same line. And we would want to do that for all healthy services named web or tagged web in our, our system. So we can do that by issuing a range query. So we want to range over all services named web. We'll end that. I'll put this here. And I think my white space is going to be messed up because I didn't practice this in advance. But basically, we're going to iterate over every service that's tagged web, print out the node name, the address, and the port. And let's see what that looks like. So we'll run the console template process. What did I call this? Example.tpl. And I'm just going to run this in dry mode since I don't actually have HAProxy installed. Perfect. My spacing is wrong, but it looks right, um, aside from my new lines, right? So we have the, the three servers. They have three different names. Those are the three IP addresses you saw from dig before. Let me fix my, my spacing here. So it'll be, it'll be technically correct. It's still not right. It's, it's closer. Um, so let's take a look at what happens. So I'm going to keep this running, and I'm going I'm to do this really jank thing where I'm going to do side-by-side -side stuff. So this is another node in the cluster. I think this is, who did this say I was? This is ant. So you can see this is ant. So uh, 10.1.2.204 is just running Nginx. It has a standard check that says, is this thing running on port 80 and returning a 200 response? So what am I going to do? I'm going to stop Nginx. <sighs> what? Ah, damn, upstart. Um, OK, so we've stopped the service. And oh, I messed up. Knew I was going to mess something up. So you get to see the check. So this is the, the actual check. Um, so it says, check that the service is running on port 80. Um, but I didn't actually tell it how frequently to check. Um, so I need to tell it uh, that I want this to be uh, every uh, two seconds or three seconds. Um, well, damn it, it happened and you didn't see it. All right, it's OK. It's, it's good now. OK, watch. So we'll start this service. And this takes a little bit longer to get registered because it has to redo the health check. But you saw like that popped up, right? Ant is back in the mix. And then we're going to come and we're going to stop it. And as soon as we stop it, you should see on the left-hand side that it re-renders that config. Um, so this is like a standard whatever could be load balancer, could be whatever config. Um, it's dynamic. So basically, as soon as console is aware of that change, the, the service becomes aware of that change, and it's edge triggered. You can see that it's blocking here. It runs as a service. We can integrate that with the key value store. So if we imagine we want to like put our thing in maintenance mode, we can say like if the key web mate exists, then we're like, I don't know, print out a comment. We're in maintenance mode. Otherwise, do all of this other stuff. Right? So standard if else. When we run this, we'll get a warning that says that key doesn't exist, but it's still running. If over here on this other server, I console kv write web mate, um, it, does, it can be any value. Oh, console kv put wrong tool. Uh, you can see like that's a lot faster because we're not doing that polling interval. Um, console uses blocking HTTP queries. So basically, the moment I hit enter, the other one's going to get boom, and it's in maintenance mode. And if I delete that key, so if I come over here and I delete that, I get really excited about this stuff. Um, if I delete this key, Right? Boom. Right? I can barely clap fast enough. Like, and there's lag on the projector, too. So like, it's even faster than you see it. 
There's lag. Like I can visibly see things happen on my laptop before they happen on the projector. It's great. Uh, so if I mess up, I can say it before you see it. Um, OK, I had one more thing. How much time do I have? OK, perfect. Um, console lock. So I have these two, these two nodes. Um, they're in the same console cluster. So I'm going to do something very basic at first. I'm going to lock. And you lock on a key. So this is where the key value store and the service discovery thing come together. So I'm going to console lock on the key foo, because it doesn't really matter. And I'm just going to sleep for five seconds. And and echo hi. OK, and I have to surround these with quotes because bash. And I'm going to run the same command over here. So I just copy and paste it. So I'm going to start this one, and I'm going to start this one. And the one on the left isn't running yet. So after five seconds, now if we count for five seconds, the one on the left will run. Hopefully. There we go. Right? So we have distributed locking. And if this was a longer running service, something that like, should always be up and running, but then isn't anymore, we could have another one automatically take over. But this is great for stuff like restarting all of the nodes in my cluster, if that's a thing that you want to do, because you're on your last day of work and you want to quit. Um, you just, <laughs> you're really, really looking forward to that severance pay. You just, you just do one of these, which is like, um, you know, console lock. Um, actually, that's not what I meant. So there's this other great tool called console exec. Uh, and console exec will run something across the entire cluster or a subset of the cluster. So if I want to restart all of the nodes, I can just sudo restart, right? That's going to restart all of them, or reboot. Sorry, I know Linux. They're going to reboot. Um, but maybe I want to restrict it to all of the services named web. So service equals web. I can close this one now. So I want to reboot all of my web servers. And I'm going to do that. And it's not going to work because I disabled it on this. Um, but it would have worked if I didn't. You have to enable exec mode because it's kind of a privileged operation. Um, so none of the nodes actually acknowledge my request to restart, um, which is a kind of a good thing. But if you opt into exec, it's really great for things like you know, doing log aggregation um, or, or you know, kind of coordinated uh, orchestration level things. So I think that's all the time I have for talking about things. But if you have questions, I can talk to you about them. Any questions? Oh, you could just say it. I'll repeat them. Oh, okay. But thank you for walking. <laughs> it means less exercise for me later. Well, there you go. Uh, thank you. Excellent talk. Um, so I can imagine situations where um, a node's opinion of itself is, you know, I'm up and everything's good, but um, something else is interfering. A firewall gets turned on in the middle, let's say, and you can't actually reach port 80 on a machine. Um, Obviously, I, or I think that's, that's sort of outside the scope of what console is meant to do. So is that something that would be delegated to <laughs> Nagio Sensu something else, or is there another way to tackle that problem? No, so really what you're talking about is a network partition, and console is actually set up perfectly to handle that, because um, the, the node's own health is determined by like, itself, right? So it has a, what's called a service level health check that is, um, you know, is my service accessible on port 80? And maybe it even has a, an outbound health check, a host level health check that's like, can I ping Google to make sure the firewall rule is outbound? And both of those could be passing, but maybe inbound traffic's not allowed. Well, in that case, we rely on the gossip protocol and the peers to actually say whether that node is accessible or not. So if you have a firewall rule where you're gossiping and all of a sudden you apply a firewall rule that subjugates your VPC or something like that, and half your nodes are no longer accessible, you have a network partition, and the other nodes will report that they can no longer see that. And that marks when a host level health check fails, all of the services are marked as failing as well. Right? So if, you have, if like your disk is full, we just assume all of the services on that are unhealthy as well. OK, so uh, just so I'm clear, it's not just um, the gossip protocol that's going on between the, the console servers, but each of the agents are also constantly talking to each other. And yes. so um, it's not that they're all checking port 80 on each other, but um, if suddenly one machine is unable to uh, respond to the gossip packets, they, they eventually coordinate and say, you're out of the pool. Yes, okay. and the, the, the algorithm for doing that and the number of nodes is determined by the size of the cluster and the latency. OK, thank you. Other questions? No other questions. You can ask me questions about other tools, too, that we make, that we make. <laughs> okay. Little asterisk there. You don't have to. It's fine. Um, so is there a possibility of having multiple console domains, or is it just one global domain? Is there any, is there any naming or hierarchy 
or sharding? So generally, you want you want to run one console cluster one console cluster per data center, which again is that high bandwidth, low latency collection of machines. So it's very rare that you would run multiple console clusters in the same data center. Now the the TLD suffix the dot console is configurable um, okay. at, in the, at the server level because that's what responds to that. So you can say like, is it technically possible? Yes. Is it architecturally a good decision? No. Um, you would, you would never want that because the servers themselves are replicated, so you already have the high availability, and you're just gonna, you can't have an agent that's connected to multiple servers in different clusters. Oh. So, like okay. one, so you would have to run two console agents on each node in order for each of them, and they would have to run on different HTTP ports, and it would be like very confusing to a human to actually like model that. Sure, yeah, I would want that if I didn't trust your software to stay running all the time, even though it's distributed. That would be the motivation, right? Because you're introducing this clearly very well architected, but potentially huge blast radius spoff in the middle, right? Well, yeah. so, distributed point so of failure? <laughs> so typically, so you run, you run an odd number of servers, right, for, for Raft, so you do three, five, or seven. Mm -hmm. If you're a big, huge, you run seven. Most of our customers get away with three. If you're a little bit bigger, you run five. Uh, everything runs in memory, but um, the newest version of console 0.7.1 actually has a built-in backup strategy. So it can back up to disk or back up to an S3 bucket, and then you can recover from that quickly. Okay. Um, the only thing you actually have to back up is the key value store, because services and everything self-register. So the agents themselves self-register. Yep. Um, if you're really concerned about availability, what we see some of the like really big customers do is they'll use like console template to write out a bind 9 configuration with a TTL of like, a little bit like a five minute TTL instead of something that's as reactionary as console is, then if console goes down, they have five minutes until their services can't talk to each other anymore. But like DNS doesn't actually work as all of you know. So like it'll be longer than five minutes anyway. Yeah. Um, so y you know, you can, you can push the resolution up to a higher level thing and everything's built for fault tolerance. Like it's, it's designed for a distributed environment, so it's designed to handle things like network latency, network partitions, someone pulling the plug on it in mid-transaction, and, and it's ACID compliant and it's CAP compliant. So like it does all of the three-letter acronym things. Good, excellent, thank you. HIPAA? <laughs> no, that's Vault. Yeah. Uh, hi, um, I work at Outbrain. We actually use console in production as the service discovery. Um, but the security team started talking about uh, integrating Vault, which I understand console is the backend for it. So I was asking, do you recommend to use the same console cluster for discovery as the backend for Vault, or should it be? Yeah, so if you're using console as the storage backend for Vault, um, it's fine, because Vault never stores data in the plain text. So even if you know, a developer has access to the key value store and you're not using the console ACLs, which you should be, but if you're not, the, the vault data is encrypted in transit and at rest. So even if someone's able to read that data, they're reading a blob of encrypted data that's encrypted by a key that rotates constantly. Um, so the, the vector is there, but it's re relatively small compared to the like, other vectors you might have, attack vectors. Um, but you can also put an ACL and say like anything in the vault um, KV prefix, which is the default for where vault stores data, requires a particular ACL token, and you just don't give that out. Um, I actually was more worried about stability because we had some console-related outages, which might be our fault and not the console itself. But how will it affect the system if we add Vault in? Will it really increase uh, the volume of data across the cluster, or would you recommend so, to use a different maybe cluster for the backend? Or no, so console's memory intensive and Vault is CPU intensive, right? So Vault does cryptography and, and uses lots and lots of CPU cycles. Um, console runs everything in memory. So if you're running into issues, you might want to split them apart. Like don't run Vault on the same physical node as console because one should be memory optimized and one should be compute optimized. You should be able to use console storage backend. If you're having issues where like things are constantly going out, like we should figure that out. Um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't have this worry um, is basically what I'm saying. But if, if you're having a real problem, it's a real problem and we should fix it. We should figure out what's going on. Um, but it shouldn't be going out like that. Like for context, we've used console in production for like four years now, um, before console was even a thing um, that was public, and it's gone down twice, and they were both our fault. Yeah, no, I'm not saying it goes down because it's our fault. Uh, for sure, usually it's uh, nodes that they think they're in one data center and they're actually in another one, which is mostly our fault. 
Um, but I was kind of worried of letting the security guys start messing around with my console cluster just because it's a very sensitive system. Once it goes down, the entire infrastructure goes down with it. Yeah, I mean, that's more of an organizational decision, too, and like how much do you trust your employees and how likely are they to screw something up. Um, if, if that's a concern of yours, like there are a number of storage backends for Vault. You don't necessarily have to use console. We recommend it because you get the leader election and the high availability out of the box. But you could just start maybe out of the box, especially if they're just playing with the tool and evaluating it. Maybe you start with the file system in a non-highly available mode. Once they get familiar with it and understand the architecture and you're, you're less concerned about them mucking about, then you can move into the, the KV store. Oh, thank you. Oh, they shut me off.